for. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your goodness and your greatness and that you have conquered Satan's sin and death. That, Lord, you came and you rescued your people in the book of Exodus, but ultimately you came and you got all of your people when you came as your son, as Christ, who redeemed all of us. And so we thank you for how uh, today's passage reminds us of you and your faithfulness and your goodness in your wonderful and holy name. Amen. I'm going to take that off because then it's not squeezing my my temporal lobes as I'm talking. So um, Exodus chapter four. So, oh, what? did it not? There's no recap there. All right. So uh, I don't know why the recap isn't in there, but it should be. Anyway, <laughs> So the chapter one talks about how uh, Pharaoh, okay, he, he made a decree that uh, he was going to kill all the baby boys. And um, chapter two, Moses, he's born into that environment, right? So his mom makes for him a ark, okay? That is the literal word, ark. Your Bible might say basket, but it's actually technically a ark. And she made this thing out of pitch and some wood and put him in a basket down by the river into the weeds. She didn't put him into the river. He didn't go sailing down the river. She put him into the reeds, okay? So, because you don't want to just launch your baby into the, into the water where there's like crocodiles, hippos, snakes, and all those kinds of things where the baby could be chomped. So, um, she, so the, the sister was standing there watching from a distance and then Pharaoh's daughter comes along and she's about to go bathing, which we know that the Egyptians at that time, they actually did this kind of thing where they actually had public swimming areas, okay? Where people would recreationally swim. They would have swimming sports and all these kinds of things. And so Pharaoh's daughter, she's down there with her attendants. This would be the princess. And so she sees this basket in the reeds. She And she hears the baby crying. So she has her attendant go and get the baby. And then Moses' older sister sees and she's like, hey, I know a woman that can help raise that baby. Would you let her do it? So Moses' mom ended up getting to raise Moses. But he was raised in the culture and the traditions of the Egyptians at a later time. And so according to uh, different people who you listen to, uh, whether it's in the book of Acts, we know that at this time, Moses was actually great in word and in deed. In Acts chapter 7, he was raised as an Egyptian and he was great in word and in deed. And if you look at different historians that actually talk about Moses, it talks about how he actually conquered uh, Ethiopia. He won different wars. Okay, So he was an active part of the Egyptian military. Right? He was actually, according to some, uh, told that he was going to inherit the throne of Egypt. Okay, So there's a lot of things that are going on at, at this time. And then what happens is at some point, Moses, he's out and he sees an Egyptian beating up one of the, the, the Hebrew slaves. And he sees this injustice and he looks around and no one's watching. So he kills the Egyptian. The next day, he's out and about, and he sees two, two Hebrews arguing. And he says, you guys, stop fighting. And like, they say, what are you going to do, kill us like you did the Egyptian? So Moses, he thinks, oh, boy, books it off into the, the wilderness, okay, because Pharaoh wants to kill him because of the fact that he killed an Egyptian, all this kind of stuff. So everyone wants to kill Moses. Moses is terrified. He runs off into the wilderness, winds up in chapter 3. He, he ends up at a, sorry, chapter 3, chapter 2, end of chapter 2. He ends up at the well. And that's where he sees some girls. They come down to water their sheep. and Because uh, you water sheep, not just plants. Okay, So you have that going on. And uh, so Moses, he actually ends up defending them because a bunch of other guys come in, try to chase them away. Moses is like, that ain't good. So the girls then, they leave him at the well instead of taking him home. They tell their dad about what happens. And he says, hey, you should have brought that guy home. Go get him. And so... Long story short, Moses marries one of his daughters and ends up working for this man named Jethro. Okay, we're introduced to him as Rael, or however you want to say it, um, which means friend of God. He was a high priest of God. He knew who God was. He served God. Moses, Moses doesn't really at this point. <laughs> okay, so Moses working for him. He goes out into the wilderness one day and comes across this bush. And it's on fire. And he thinks, huh, that's funny. There's a bush on fire, but it's not being consumed. It's not, it's not burning up. So he goes over and he looks at it. 
And out of that bush, God speaks to him. So God gets his attention with the bush and God reveals himself to Moses. We learn more about God in that interaction. We, Because he says, uh, Moses starts questioning God, creating all these excuses why he can't go back to Egypt. And God promises, I will be with you. You're not going to be alone. I will be who I will be. You try to, you want to peg me down as someone else, but I am God. I am Yahweh. I am who I am. That is me. And then God says, what's in your hand? And so Moses has the staff and God shows Moses that he's a God of miracles. And so then Moses, he, he starts kind of creating more excuses and, and, is, and so it ends up being ultimately that God says, I'm angry at you. Get to work. <laughs> you can let your brother speak because Moses, he claimed he couldn't speak very well, which we know is not true. <laughs> Moses lied in that moment. And Moses, well, he ends up doing what God calls him to do. And we wind up in chapter four, um, which is where we are picking up. Then, so Moses has this encounter with God. Now, then Moses goes back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return. What was that? Was it? Is that that? Can you drop the base? Or you got the baby? I'll, do it. I'll turn off the base. All right. <laughs> Boop. There we go. Done. Um, it wasn't the Lord speaking. That was a base. Um, <laughs> so let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. God promised that the the Egypt, the Hebrews, they're alive, uh, that they're, they're fine, that God, he's called to redeem them. So Moses, it seems like maybe he's not telling the truth, which we'll talk about in a moment. But Jethro says, go and I wish you well. So Moses, okay, so this is a basic little family lesson for us. If you're working for your father-in-law, especially, get his permission and get his blessing to go get another job, all right? So like, because you don't want to mess up that family business. You don't want to be the one responsible for that. Uh, Moses, just because he heard from God, though, he doesn't immediately assume authority. How many times have we known people throughout the years or heard about people that they're like, I got a word from God, so now I'm the boss. Moses doesn't actually assume authority. He, he, he gets permission from his father-in-law. So what we, what we see, though, is he doesn't tell Jethro all of what happened as he's seeking that permission. So was it because of fear, right? Was Moses like, if I tell him when I, that, that a bush just talked to me, he's going to think I'm insane, right? Or was, he, or was he just scared as to what Jethro might do, right? You want to take my kid and my grandkids? You want to take them down to Egypt? Eh. Or was it, okay? Because I'm just going to provide to you the options, okay? Because that's what we do. We like to go through biblically and look at what are the options. So was it that uh, he actually was saying, uh, kind of like in the book of Genesis, when Joseph found out that his father was still alive. When Joseph was uh, second in command of all of Egypt in the last chunk of Genesis there, chapter 40, I think it was. Um, he says, go and check on my father. Tell me, is he well? So when Moses says to go see if they're alive. The wording is actually very similar to see, like, let me see if they're well. So it might be that Moses didn't lie. It just might be that he's actually saying, I, I need to go check on and see them if they're okay. Or was it a test? And this is a possibility too, right? Like God just said this thing to me. I'm going to talk to Jethro and I'm just trusting God, right? I'm not going to give him all the details. I'm just going to trust that God's in charge of this because maybe Jethro, which we don't know about him, was a, a bit of a workhorse, <laughs> right? We knew that Jethro, he was big on strategies. We learned this later, actually. Uh, I think it's in the end of in Deuteronomy or maybe the last chunk of Exodus. I can't remember exactly right now. Um, but we, we know that he, he, he was a person that cared about workflow. He, he worried about not making sure or making sure that someone wasn't overburdened with their work. So maybe Moses is just like, hey, I got to just test God in this and just say like, hey, I got to go do this. Hopefully God's been working on his heart. He claims to know God too. So all of those are possibilities. You can pick your favorite one. Um, but here's the thing. One of the things that we should maybe take a moment and ask ourselves is, how should we test if God spoke to us? So a little bit of my story. 
was when I was in, uh, when I, I fir- so I first became a Christian when I was in grade nine. I gave my life to Jesus. And then a couple months after that, I was at camp. Okay. So Bible camp where you go, you play your games and you goof off during the day, cause all your problems, hurt yourself. And at night, uh, all the people that you fought with throughout the day, you're all in church together, worshiping Jesus. And it's in those services that God speaks and he moves and he encourages students and they have an encounter with him. Me, it was no different. I don't remember what the sermon was about. I just remember (laughs) that I was responding to whatever the altar call was. I don't even think I was responding to what the actual altar call was. I just wanted to get closer to Jesus. And so I just go and I lay on my face on the carpet, nothing hyper-spiritual. I was just making sure I was just focused. I'm like, if I, if I look around, there's some girls that I had a crush on and I was like, oh, they're kind of cute. So what if I focus on the floor, if I look at the grain of the carpet, I will be focused and I'll be able to see and hear Jesus maybe a little bit better because I've never really seen or heard him before. So I'm there and I'm praying and just saying, God, what do you want? And he spoke and he said, you're going to be a youth pastor. You're going to go to Western Pentecostal Bible College. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I got up I told my youth pastor right away. Uh, and uh, actually it was youth leader, youth intern at that time. It was, his name was Mike. And, uh, and he's just like, oh, okay, that's cool. Because he didn't believe me. Because most kids, if you don't know, they go to Bible camp. All of a sudden they have this calling and this mission from God to go and do something. And uh, so <laughs> he's like thinking I was no different. But I knew what I had heard. And so then a week after that, they were doing baptisms at our church. So I went and got baptized. Okay, so I got saved, got my calling, got baptized, all within the process of about two months. And and it was awesome. It was great. And so I told my pastors. But here's the thing. I didn't just have the call. I started living it out. I started walking in it. There was evidence because I was now leading worship. I was now teaching Bible studies. I was doing ministry, working with Youth for Christ and and serving in our community and and helping with kids ministry and then helping with youth ministry and helping with all these things. And then I went to the Bible college that God told me I was going to go to because that's pretty much a sign, right? God says, you're going to be a youth pastor. You're going to go to Western Pentecostal Bible College. Now, they changed the name to Summit Pacific College right before I went. So I actually did have like this moment of crisis because I'm like, they just changed the name. (sighs) Now I can't do what God wants me to do. And then my youth pastor at that time, he's like, you're an idiot. Just go. (laughs) I was like, okay. So apparently this isn't a big deal. I'm looking way too much into this. He just told me what school. So I went to the school and then I became a youth pastor. So how do I know that I heard from God? I did it and you fulfilled it, (laughs) okay? So ultimately, that's how you know. However, there's this one quote that I would like us to think about for a moment. It's far more important and more beneficial for others to see the fruit of God's guidance in your life than to hear you explain all you believe God said to you. This, I wouldn't say, is for every instance, but I would say it's it's a healthy thing to consider for a moment that it's far more important and beneficial for others to see the fruit of God's guidance in your life than to hear you explain all you believe God said. Moses had this amazing experience where he heard from God. He got all of these details, where he was going, who God was. Maybe you've had similar experiences yourself. Maybe you've seen other people claim to have these experiences. Like, I heard God, and God said to do this, and God said to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be this. And then they kind of go the exact opposite way in everything. So what they did is they just created a distrust in God, because did God really say that? And can we trust them to be faithful with what God trusted them? I'm not saying, because this guy is saying, (laughs) essentially, he was saying, just keep it to yourself. I'm saying sometimes. What I would suggest is if you feel God saying something to you, we all, like, if you're you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in you, but so do other Christians. And so go and talk to a trusted Christian. Talk to another leader, someone who loves Jesus, who, who they can help you discern. 
right? Because he, he, what they shouldn't do right off the hop is just be like, God didn't tell you that, <laughs> okay? So if someone just right off the hop just, just writes it off, okay, just maybe go find another source. Receive what you can from them, but maybe just go talk to another person. Because what they should do is immediately be like, well, let's start praying about it, right? If you're not sure, if you're really questioning, let's, let's pray about this. Let's talk about it. And how can I help you fulfill God's call? Right? That should basically be the conversation that we as Christians have with one another in general. But when we feel like we hear directly from God about doing and saying or being something, that's typically the process that we should probably take. On top of, because this is assuming we're reading the Bible and we're seeing that what's actually in this isn't conflicting with what we feel God's saying. Because if God's telling you to go and do something that goes opposed to what the Bible says, you're probably going to have some problems. So make sure that you're trying to read this thing and understand it as best you can. And you go and talk to other leaders when you feel like you hear from God. But remember, the way you live it out is far more important. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. And this right here is Palm Sunday. Moses the Redeemer, is riding in on the donkey. So when you see Jesus riding in on the donkey on Palm Sunday in the Bible, yes, you should picture the fanfare, you should picture the palm leaves and all that kind of stuff because all that stuff is true. This should bring you back to this moment when God sent the Redeemer to get the people and set them free. That is key, <laughs> okay? So God being gracious, though, because, again, Moses, we're, we, what we're learning about Moses is that when you see him in chapter 3, you see him in chapter 2, when he faces, like, real confrontation, he tends to be a guy that makes excuses and runs at this stage in his life. He's timid and he's scared. God is being gracious and saying, there's no active threat in Egypt right now. When you go in, it's going to be neutral. <clears throat> oh, so there, there, there was one of the recap slides, apparently. Um, so again, but this is where we need to understand that Jesus, he also didn't want to die. For some people, this comes as a shock. But when you read the scriptures, Jesus, he's in the garden praying before he's arrested. And he's having the disciples pray. They fall asleep, <laughs> right? But Jesus, he's praying, Father, if there's any way other than me dying, please let it happen. Take this cup from me, but not my will. Your will be done. And Jesus was willing to go. Jesus was honest with God. To Moses' credit, he was honest with God. <laughs> Moses just kept making excuses, but Jesus right away said, not my will, but yours be done. So while Moses, he's this great figure, and we should look at him and be like, what he did was really important. His faithfulness overall was really significant. But the difference between Moses and Jesus is Moses was definitely not perfect. Jesus was. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. Right? So if you, if you remember, there was the, the, the staff, it turned into the snake. He put his hand into his shirt and it came out leprous. He put it back in and it was clear. So God's saying, make sure that you do these things. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Moses is given the final outcome ahead of time. 
God knows ultimately how this is going to play out. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Another way to actually uh, translate that word hardened is heavy. Maybe I can't remember if I've talked about this before, but that, that Hebrew word is actually means heavy, like a rock, heavy. And if you know anything about Egyptian uh, history and spirituality, they believe that the heavier the heart was, if your heart was heavy, then you're going to hell. So God's ultimately saying, I'm going to judge Pharaoh. So it's a judicial, hard, judicial hardening. I'm going to harden him. I'm going to judge Pharaoh. I know how this is all going to go. And it's going to culminate in me killing the firstborn sons of Egypt. Now, we say, like, obviously, that's drastic, okay? And, and that's fair. Because that is a drastic thing. God killing the firstborn son of animal and people. That's insane. Like, that's crazy, God. Why would you do that? But remember, the first the opening in the chapter, for opening chapter of Exodus, what was the command to kill the sons of the Hebrews? God made this promise back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, I think it was. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. God made a promise and he's keeping it. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And then in the story, something really random happens and it throws everything off for the moment. Okay? Because here's the thing. This portion is weird. And some pastors, they don't talk about it for, for different reasons we'll talk about in a moment. At a lodging place along the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Okay? So this is your rubberneck moment. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that, at that time, she said bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Now, some pastors, they would skip through this because, yes, it's really weird. <laughs> Okay, because it's like, so they're just on their way, on the donkey. All of a sudden, God shows up and says, I'm going to kill you. And <laughs> Zipporah, his wife, ends up grabbing the flint knife, circumcising the son, and throwing it or placing it at the feet of Moses. Like, what is this? The Bible has some weird things, okay? So let's, let's be totally honest about that. There are weird things that happen, which probably, again, tells you, more likely true than not because <laughs> it's telling you these weird details that you get so it actually is it's it's helpful to the truthfulness of scripture because it's not hiding this stuff and for some people they might think this is irrelevant however i don't believe that it ultimately is now the the thing is there's a bunch of opinions about this what's going on here because translators they argue about this because no one really ultimately knows what the heck any of that means, <laughs> right? Why did God want to kill Moses? It's not very clear. We have a, like, there's there's kind of like a generic understanding as to, to why, as we're going to talk about in a moment, but, like, it's really hard for these guys to translate. I don't know why. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, okay? But when you read the commentaries, everyone basically opens up with this portion. This is really hard to understand. But it's important that we talk about this stuff because it's those hard to understand portions of scripture that you get really weird teaching, cult practices, and all that kind of stuff out of. And so what, that's why I think it's important for us to talk about this stuff so that when we come up to these portions of scripture, we can say, oh, okay, so this is one of those portions. I'm allowed to have an opinion, just like my nose. Everyone has one. Sometimes it blows. Okay? So I just thought of that rhyme right now. I thought it was wonderful. All right. Uh, <laughs> everyone of no, again, it seems to agree. Um, so Moses' son was obviously not circumcised. What was the sign of uh, the covenant? It was circumcision. So Moses' son wasn't circumcised. So this is a question where basically God's mad at Moses. Okay, so this seems to be the general understanding. God's mad at Moses 
because Moses is actually being unfaithful because his son isn't part of the covenant promise. How can you go and be my redeemer if your kids aren't even part of this? You want to go save a nation? Worry about your family first. Jesus has this similar conversation. <laughs> So Moses' family needed to be fully in on this. So whether it's Zipporah's fault, we don't know. Some commentators, they think it's it's on her. And that's why she's kind of upset in the moment. You've made me a bridegroom of, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. We don't know. The, it, it's ultimately that question of be faithful. Is Moses being faithful with what God has trusted him with? So the question for us is, are we being faithful? If we feel God calling us to do something, are we trying our best to make sure that everything around us that we have control over is aligned with him? So are you being faithful? Am I being faithful? Then the Lord said to Aaron, Okay, so if you remember in chapter 3, when Moses was arguing with, with God, and he said, I can't speak. God said, Moses, your brother Aaron is on the way. Now we're getting the update. This is when Aaron's on the way. The Lord said to Aaron, Aaron can hear from God. This, I'm not going to lie. When I was looking at this, like I, I've known this, but I never really thought about it. Usually we just picture Moses speaking and Aaron being the mouthpiece. Aaron actually heard from God. What all Aaron knows or God gave him details about, we don't know. But God said to him, go into the wilderness and meet Moses. That's why God knew Moses was on the way. Because he told, him, he told Aaron, go. <laughs> and Aaron was going. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had said to him to say, and also all about the signs he had commanded to perform him. It was important that Aaron knew <laughs> what God had said. Why? Because Moses roped him in. <laughs> so I kind of picture the, the whole conversation, like God saying to Aaron, so God did this, God said this, God said this, God said this. By the way, God said, you're my mouthpiece. And here's the thing. I just about died 10 minutes ago. So uh, we should really, you, you should really be, be like doing what God tells you to do. <laughs> I thought that was funnier than it was. All right. So, um, <laughs> but, but th that's the thing. Like, like, are you being faithful? Is Aaron going to be faithful? Is Moses going to be faithful? So Moses and Aaron, they brought together. So they wind up in Egypt. Okay. So they ride in together. Moses' wife and kids, Aaron, they bring together all the elders of the Israelites. So the 12 tribes, the guys that are in charge of each family, they come and Aaron tells them everything that the Lord had told Moses. So this is the practice run. And then there's that word, he also performed the signs, which we'll talk about in a moment. And they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. So Aaron, he recounts the event. And that word, he, in Hebrew, it points to being about Moses. So Aaron, he's the mouthpiece. Moses, he performs the signs. This is practice. You're going to do it with your people. Then you're going to be doing it in front of Pharaoh. And again, these they're honoring the elders. One of the things that you see actually all throughout the Old Testament is honoring those who are in authority. Are you honoring those in authority over you? Right, so Pastor Ken's here today, so I can talk about him. Right, and it's not behind his back. Right, I've often told people that he's one of those guys that's a person of character and a person of substance. So he was our interim pastor in Listwell for several years. So when he was up there and he was my boss, okay, 
there were things that, believe it or not, him as my boss, he told me to do things that I didn't like, that I didn't want to do. He made it a joy to submit to him. <laughs> I knew he loved me. I knew he cared about me. And so I was like, okay, I'll just go and do those things. There are other people in my life who I did not respond that way to. <laughs> Sometimes those people did care about me. Sometimes they didn't. How I responded matters. And in this moment, Moses and Aaron, they're, they're doing the right thing. They're honoring the leaders and allowing them to see and to speak into the moment, getting them on board, trusting God with the results of passing along the information. And the elders believed. Why did they believe? And this is important. I want us to remember this verse. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. When we see that God cares passionately and deeply, when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. They saw the signs, but what did they believe? That God saw them. God heard them. God knew what they were going through. In the Gospel of Matthew, you actually see a lot of these themes. John, in the, that Gospel, that picks up some of this stuff too. But, but in Matthew, you, you specifically see this kind of language repeated. Matthew was one of the apostles of Jesus. And he, he recounted one of the, the, the testimonies about what Jesus did and how he lived and how he rose again. And you see that Jesus sees the people suffering or in need and he heals them or corrects the situation. Whether it's a storm that's going on, whether it's a person that needs to take up their mat and go home, or someone's demon-possessed and he casts the demon out, setting that person free, or someone's little girl is dead and Jesus raises that little girl from the dead. Jesus sees these needs. He has compassion and he heals them. And the people, they, they usually they worship him in response. In Matthew chapter 9, it says this. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees the people. Right now, I want you to apply this to yourself. Jesus sees Lucan. Jesus sees Ontario, he sees Canada, he sees the world. He has compassion on them. What he does, though, in this moment, <laughs> is he looks to the apostles. He looks to the 12, possibly others that are with him. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Redeemers. Moses was called to be a redeemer. We are called to actively be ambassadors for the redeemer. We have a purpose. So while we may ourselves have issues and things that God needs to speak to and address that he sees the needs because the disciples were no different. He said, buckle up, get to work. The workers are few. So right now you might have your own stuff, but are you looking to the general need that is out there. Maybe for you, it is helping out with kids. <laughs> that is a general need. The workers are few. <laughs> Wasn't plugging in that way. Just funny thought. But 
We are called to make disciples. We are called to be working for Jesus and to see the lost come to know him. And tell people God sees the junk in your life. It may not all be perfect right now. Things might not go the way you want it to go. But he has a plan. One day, and this sounds really weird. I mean, he, he takes people through water on dry land. He raises people from the dead. He speaks through bushes on fire. He sends angels to do crazy things. He tells people to walk around a town for seven days. And then when they play some music and scream, the walls are going to come down. Jesus is coming back. He's established all of this crazy precedent. He's coming back to bring his people back to him. Where in the end of the book of Revelation, it's the last book in your Bible. He will wipe every tear. He will embrace you. He will hug you. Ultimately, because of him, you win. The workers are few. And that's part of the good news. Maybe you need to embrace that today. Maybe you need to hear God sees me. But he doesn't just see me. He's calling me. Jesus, we ask you that right now, maybe we've been here for years. Maybe we've been going to church for years, hearing different sermons or whatever, but never truly responded. That, Lord, maybe we're like Moses and we just keep making excuses. Maybe... Maybe we've just never actually had the opportunity to respond. Well, today is the day where we make a choice to respond to you. I ask that we would be faithful. Lord, we know Moses wasn't perfect. We know the disciples weren't perfect. We know that there's only one perfect person in all of Scripture, and that's you. And for whatever reason, you've called us, the imperfect, to send your perfect message. Father, I ask that we would receive it ourselves, knowing that you died in our place for our sin, and that you rose again, giving us right standing with God, and you promised you're coming back, and we will join in in eternal life. And what is eternal life? It is knowing God and the one he sent. That Jesus, this is all about a person, which is you. It's not about a place. So may we run after the right person. Because God, when you went into Egypt with Moses, yes, you were taking them to a land. Because everybody winds up somewhere. But you were calling them to know you. May we know you. And Father, if there's anyone in here that needs to respond, I pray they would. Help them to do so boldly and courageously. And if that's someone's been in following you for a while and they've not been baptized. Maybe they've told people they have been and lied. Put it on their heart that they would be baptized and make that public confession of their faith. We love you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you for all that you have done. The Lord, it's all on you. It's not on us. We just have to accept and, and believe what you've said. May you bless everybody here that's, that's either watching online or present here. May they have an encounter with you today. Holy Spirit, do a great work in, through, and around them. And may they respond positively to your call. In your wonderful and mighty name, amen.
And so if you have any thoughts or questions, feel free to ask, talk to me. And uh, maybe you need to tell somebody about something you feel God telling you. Do that. Trusted leader, right? But here's the thing. Walk in whatever God's calling you to. Walk and be faithful. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day.